and I would be your moderator this morning. I'm the chair of the Leadership Council at World of Money and an investment banking associate at Morgan Stanley. But more importantly, I'm really excited for you all to meet two phenomenal women, Elizabeth Bucco and Sheila Mboga, who are here with us today. Elizabeth currently resides in the UK. She is an author and wealth coach. She helps entrepreneurs improve their finances and start their wealth building journey by changing the way they think about money from a faith-based perspective. Elizabeth has helped women eliminate tens of thousands of personal debt, start investing in their financial goals, grow their net worth to multiple six and seven figures, and let go of deep personal beliefs that limit them financially. She's also the founder of Wealth from Little, where she runs monthly wealth creation classes. She's married and has two young children. We also have here with us Sheila, who currently resides in Dubai. Sheila is an NFEC certified financial education instructor, a financial literacy advocate, and member of the Personal Finance Speakers Association. She's focused on spreading financial literacy awareness to help people and businesses become better money managers, ultimately achieving their financial goals. Her passion in creating a financially healthy society led her to start Financial Wellness Center and the Entrepreneurs Academy. Her vision is to inspire Africa and the world to help people integrate money management skills into their core value systems in day-to-day -day lives, thereby achieving financial wellness. Her vision is to live a financially healthy lifestyle. With that, welcome, ladies. <laughs> no, that was a mouthful. Let's jump right in. We each have a personal relationship with money, which defines how we handle money. You both embarked on your respective journeys from these firsthand experiences you had while managing your own money or things you observed from family and friends on how they manage their money and or thoughts around their finances. Can you share with us what prompted you to get started and the why behind starting your businesses centered around personal finance and money management? And Elizabeth, I guess, do you want to kick us off there? Yeah, thank you, Shante, for the amazing introduction. Um, yeah, so I started Welcome Little because of my own personal wealth journey. Ever since I was a teenager, I knew I wanted to be wealthy. I had this vision, you know, as <laughs> many young people do, you know, you want to be, you want to have more than enough resources. You want to have more than enough financial resources. And I did. Um, but I wasn't sure how to go about that. When I had got my first job, I, um, around 19, I, I saved as much as I could and I started investing. I started investing blindly. I didn't know how to invest. I didn't know how to get information about investing. Those I asked about, inv about investing were people around me that didn't really know how to, um, how to invest here in the UK. So it was kind of like a, just like throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping something stuck, right? And it, it, it looked like it was sticking and then it didn't. Fast forward like five years later, when I was a full graduate, I sought an op um, advice from a bank, from my bank manager at the time. And I asked that, what can I do? There's something that people do to make, you know, to grow their wealth where they have much more money without having to work more. What can I do? He looked at my bank account. He looked at my savings. He said, oh, wow, you're doing so well. Keep doing what you're doing. And at that point, my ego got stroked and I thought, yes, that's all I need to do. Just keep doing what I'm doing. And what I was doing at the time was earning, going to work, saving, putting some in my savings account and spending the rest. And I just kept doing that over and over again. Fast forward a few years later, I was married with now a second baby on the way and I got made redundant. And my role got made redundant. And at that point, I realized that the, my cycle, that, that pattern couldn't work anymore because there was nothing to earn so that I could, I could save and I could spend, right? There was, it, there was no input anymore. And I, I realized at that point that I knew that something was missing, but I allowed my ego to be stroked and not to actually decide that I needed to find out what that was. So while I was off work, 
um, I started doing a lot of work. I was thinking that and seeing that, you know what, my wealth building journey has been stalled and I needed to catch up and find out what the loopholes were. What was it that I was doing that, or I wasn't doing that I should have been doing so that I wouldn't have, so that my money wouldn't have stopped growing. Because now, every time I looked at my bank account, it was just reducing. <laughs> the same things were like getting smaller and not getting bigger. <laughs> and so, um, and that was when I actually educated myself about investing and turning savings and growing it and actually turning it into financial wealth. Um, and that, and not just investing any blindly like I did the first time but investing intelligently, understanding what I was investing in, understanding why I was investing. Because those first um, few stocks I invested in, in my teen years, eventually went bust and I lost the money. But, so so that's why not just rushing to invest is, is not necessarily the answer, but understanding like, like the last speakers shared, like getting some education, and understanding exactly what I'm supposed to be doing with money, how understanding my uh, advers- my my how how um, how much I can tolerate risk, and just getting to know myself in that area. And as I started to do that, that enabled me to that literally turned into wealth from little because as I re I started to rebuild and regrow my wealth from little. Um, I encourage all those around me to come on the same journey too and, and start to build their wealth as well from little. <laughs> Amazing. Sheila, do you want to share your, your journey? Sure. Thank you so much, Shante, for that awesome introduction, as well as Elizabeth. Your story is quite uh, inspiring. For me, um, the reason I started my financial journey as well as financial wellness center is the community I grew up in. I saw how people would, you know, immediately change whenever the subject of money was brought up, especially when it had to do with taking responsibility. So you'd find people having a very nice conversation, but when they are asked to, you know, like, we need money to buy this, we need money to do this, immediately that conversations that conversation became sour and people were like you know frowning and you know not so comfortable now this made me become curious like what is it about money that makes people uh change drastically so i started to uh research about money i started to study about money and by the time I was uh, becoming a young adult, like late teens towards uh, uh, my early 20s, I already knew like this is, I was able to join the dots. Most people, they have made money to hurt them more than help them because we know money is a tool. And like any other tool, if you misuse that tool, it's going to hurt you. And um, that is how I came now across principles of money that most people, maybe they didn't know about it. That's why money could hurt them. And I decided now that I know this, I started applying them in my personal life first so that I I could come and say this is tried and tested. And then uh, I I started to share it out with people and that brought brought, uh, financial wellness center into the picture. Yes. I love it. I love it. So, you know, regardless of what country you're in, we've all heard the stats as it relates to pay disparities amongst men and women. And we often find that women are much more likely to find themselves financially vulnerable. And, you know, we have, you know, Sheila, you're in Dubai, Elizabeth, you're in the UK. And this is a trend we're seeing no matter where you are. I guess if we had to sum it up and just, you know, maybe one or three reasons, what would your your take be why we see women globally not taking an active role in managing their money? Sheila, do you want to kick us off there? 
Sure, thank you so much for that great question. I think women lack confidence with money. So you find that uh, most women, they're not confident enough to take charge of their money. They're not confident enough to uh, to decide, like, I'm going to take control of my money and I'm going to do A, B, C, D. We, based on how we've grown up, there's this stereotype that, you know, finances are a man's thing. So as a woman, you don't, think about it. it also uh, research shows that most women they are just especially in households they are led to do the budgeting but not the investing so you find uh, a woman is not able to make great decisions when it comes to investing or finding more ways to raise income for the for her future just because they are not used to that another thing is uh, most women have this uh, mentality that you know it's a man's job to take care of my future it's a man's job to know uh, how my future will be they do not take an active role uh, when it comes to se um, securing and planning their future, especially financially. And thirdly, I would say that um, most women tend to shy off when it comes to uh, asking more about financial services. They, we do not have that safe environment where a woman can walk into a consultancy firm and say, you know what, I need to know if I want to retire at this age, what do I need to do? Most of us have that fear that um, you know, we're like, what will they think of me? What will uh, the consultant uh, think about me? So that fear becomes like a limiting belief that makes uh, women not to uh, grow forward when it comes to uh, matters finances. Thank you. Elizabeth, what are some of your thoughts there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with Sheila um, because we know that for decades, like not like decades ago, not too far in the, in the past, that it was a man's responsibility to go and work and earn the money. And the woman was the chief caregiver and the chief homemaker and the chief wife. She was trained to be the wife. She was trained to be the uh, child raiser. She was trained to be the homemaker. And um, and so and, and and then the man would make the money and he would, you know, give out pocket money to the kids and he might give out pocket money to his wife. He might give her enough to take care of the house not necessarily to give her complete control of all of his finances. And she probably didn't have any of her own. So it has now become a thing that, you know, if something is said often enough, it becomes believed as truth, right? Even if it's a lie. So I feel like over the years, women now have adopted this view that they are, they should be in certain areas, certain rooms. They have leadership in only certain areas and certain rooms, but not in other areas, right? And which is not necessarily the truth because we know that even from biblical times, there's the story of the daughters of Zelophe, Zelophed who um, demanded from Moses when they were entering the promised land that their father only had five daughters, no sons, and then inheritance was usually passed only to men. And they stood up for themselves and said, no, we don't have any brothers, but we want our father's inheritance because our father is dead. And Moses prayed about it and God said, what they have said is right. And the laws changed from there that women should also get inheritance. But again, society comes back, and this is biblical times, but yet society comes back to <laughs> thousands of years later, and we've turned it back again to women cannot ask for what they want. And if they ask for what they want, it's wrong, right? When it is not, right? It's, it's been proven that it is not right. Women have been leaders for many years in different societies, but yet somehow it's skewed up <laughs> over and over. We have these cycles. And, and that makes women feel less confident, less um, clear in terms of what the clarity they need uh, for to, to, to ask the right questions or to get the right help. And even when they are trying to get the right help, sometimes they, the lack of confidence comes through and they sometimes are not 
given access to the help that they, they want. I know that you mentioned, Shante, um, in our previous conversation that only just in the 1970s were women actually allowed to have a bank account in the US, right? Think about the rest of the world. <laughs> so, um, so that definitely does have a, a big impact, but it needs to change. And I think it needs to change uh, with compassion as well, because, you know, we've been through so much trauma of being put down financially for so many years. But that needs to change with compassion because women are living longer, right? We are spending more years out of the workforce, which means that if you're not, or at least in the UK, if you, are, if you haven't been in the workforce for a certain number of years, when it comes to retirement and getting a state pension, you will not be entitled to the, few, to the full state pension, which isn't that much to start with. So, so for women who take time out to take care of their children, they may end, end up at retirement with, in poverty because they don't have access to the full state pension. So we are living longer. We have, we're, we're working, we're in the workforce less. Well, as a, you know, if you're in full time employment and we have a lot more responsibilities then there are women who may end up being divorced, who are maybe the main caregivers again with their children. And so therefore they do, we do need to collectively encourage more women to take an active role in their finances because it's so important for them. It's so important for the next generation. It's so important for society, um, for us as women, for every woman to not just a select few, but for every woman to take, to have, <laughs> at least a, a minimum level of financial education um it's it's not a luxury anymore it's really a necessity it's it's so interesting how you talk about biblical times and then till now and yeah i did mention like 1974 was the equal credit opportunity act which was passed that allowed women to start their own business or get a loan without it being you know co-signed by a man it's as if your presence <laughs> meant nothing <laughs> uh, without, you know, getting that that permission from your husband. And then if you were unmarried, I don't even think they even looked at your application. So it, it's interesting how we are slowly making progress, but there is still a gap to fill there. Uh, I, I know we can, we might spend some time here, but wealth is truly what we accumulate, not what we spend. And we discussed how um, in our previous conversations, just with the panelists, and we were getting to know each other, how, you know, looks can be deceiving. We see so many individuals who are high income earners who just are not affluent and many who, you know, just display high consumption lifestyles with little or no investments. How would you both describe your spending habits in your earlier years? And what were some of the first steps you took to truly take control of your finances? Are the one of you can kick this off. <laughs> um, first steps I took, um, I would say, okay, I would say I owe my um, financial habits and spending habits to my family because they are all inherited. <laughs> um, my mother was raised me up in a way in which we were almost. Uh, <laughs> kind of like living poor and being rich in a way. <laughs> so she had more than enough financial resources, yet we were constantly like, you don't need that. Why do you want to spend that? Don't waste that food. Finish every, that kind of, that kind of um, uh, home where we, she did not like wastage. She did not like things spoiling. She did not like things having to, wanting to, need, you know, needing replacement, like money was just to be spent consistently. She did not, she what she didn't live that way. And so um, I kind of grew up in that environment where I was like, okay, so kind of like, like don't spend anything, try not to spend anything. That was the mindset. And um, growing into my early twenties, my, my brother, my elder brother gave eldest brother gave me a really great advice that really helped me as I entered the workforce because I had that mindset of do not spend anything, save it all. 
And as I said, when I was 19, I started investing, right? And I didn't, I tried not to spend much at all. I saved it all and I took that whole chunk into this investment and it, it didn't work out so well at that time. But what he shared with me was that make sure that your living expenses then as a single lady was less than 47% of your income. And that really helped me. So I was constantly doing my budget each, 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 every, um, each month, making sure that, okay, what's my rent? What's my bills? What's everything? What's my food? What's my transportation fare? What's everything? And how much am I earning? Is it less than 70, 47? And he told me that if it's more than 47, you're most likely living above your means. <laughs> and that, you know, I don't know where he got those numbers from, but it really, as a young adult, it really helped me ensure that I wasn't being carried away with peer pressure or being carried away with the you know, desire to have nice things now that I actually have the money to buy them. Um, it helped me pay, you know, rent an, a, an affordable apartment that I could actually live in without stressing about bills. It helped me and it shaped a, a habit where I'm not living paycheck to paycheck because, you know, we have that lifestyle creep that once your mind is adjusted to this level of lifestyle, it's hard to like cut back or anything. And so just starting off in that level and saying, okay, I'm not going to go above 47%. So I have 53% for savings and investments just helped stop that lifestyle creep it and it was just a, a great um retainer for me and i think that helped me many years later when um i eventually you know my role got made redundant because i already had the habit of saving more than enough and i had something uh, stacked for the rainy day for the rain <laughs> And Sheila, how how about you? When did you start, you know, taking control of your finances, and what did that what did that look like? Uh, for me, it started with changing my mindset because I noticed that uh, most of the habits we have in our adulthood they were formed in our childhood, and you know, everything that we've accumulated as we grow up. And this includes how you saw people handling money. Uh, the same way I, Elizabeth has said, what she saw her mother do, she grew up knowing that money is only to be hoarded, not to be spent. So that is uh, that is a mindset that she got while she was growing up. So I, start, I started by changing my mindset, and that included... Uh, training myself it also included i starting to do things that i was scared of doing with finances for example i was scared of budgeting i was like oh no let me just spend where the money finishes we wait but once i learned about budgeting i stopped viewing a budget as an enemy but uh, as a tool that can help me direct my money so uh, by changing my mindset, that was the first step that really helped me because now I was able to know my money goes here. This is how I want it to be. I got the uh, control of money and gave it direction. Then uh, fast forward after budgeting, now I started learning how to save because, you know, if you are not budgeting with some direction, you might find yourself with a lot of disposable income and if you really do not know what to do with it, you might find yourself playing the vicious cycle. You're, you are having disposable money, you're spending it all, then you're waiting to live paycheck to paycheck. But before I could like really uh, focus on the saving, I had to become also good at setting my own financial goals because that is against something else. And I have seen it uh, with so many of our clients at Financial Wellness Center whereby somebody saves for one year and then at the end of that year they withdraw all that saving just to hold a party to call people to tell them i've saved so let's have party and blow off the all the money then again the next year they start the same so you find that they're not multiplying this money yes they're saving but they're not multiplying it because they didn't have a goal to start with so 
I had to start learning how to set financial goals that I could save for. And of course, we need to multiply money because that is how your money will grow. So I had to learn about investing, ways of investing, and of course, know what kind of investment works for me. Because, you know, when, when you talk about investments, we have to talk about risk analysis. There are some people who they are not risk averse, while there are others who are like, it's okay, if I lose all my money, it's okay, I can get another one. But for some, if they lose even a quarter of their money, they're going to be sick. So I had to first of all analyze what's my risk uh, cap capability and then what are the options I can invest in based on what I can handle. And of course, the most important thing I had to learn is to get more income because um, if you don't have money, how will you do all these things, you know? <laughs> yeah. Agreed. And if you don't have money, I mean, it's, it's easy to be risk adverse and not want to lose any of it. <laughs> you don't have any to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in America, nearly 7.1 million households in the U.S. are currently just unbanked, no access to financial resources. And that's across Black, Hispanic, and Latino communities, which make up about over 60% of that population. If we had to compare this to, you know, the U.K., um, Sheila, I know you're also Kenyan, so Kenya, Dubai, any trends that you guys are seeing as women across the world with this lack of access to financial resources? And have there been any areas where you might have seen improvement and maybe in what ways that you could share? Oh, <laughs> it's fine. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, yeah, so... There is a similar trend in the UK, but it's not as drastic as numbers as there are in America. So in the UK, there are about 4% of the population are unbanked. And in that number, and that's about 1.3 million people. And in that number, like twice as many um, Black, Asian or minority, minority ethnic people than there are um, white people. So there are... Uh, there are many people that are unbanked and the reason for that could be a variety of things, maybe um, due to poor financial experiences in the past, um, having, you know, having a poor credit score, um, not just, or not even trusting the banks. A lot of people don't trust the banks. They, they, they prefer to keep their money with them. A lot of people have had um, terrible experiences with financial services and they, they they choose not to put their money there until and then that means that they don't have a good credit score and then when they want to start doing anything financially they can't actually do that because they don't have a bank account it also means that a lot of them are operating purely in cash and it's costing them a lot more money because you know when you if you are just operating in cash, you are shopping with to things that are like that you can you have immediate access to, and it's and right now in the UK that people who operate who spend purely in cash then um, and have no bank accounts spend about four hundred and eighty five pounds a year or more than uh, those who who are who operate online. Um, what we can do about that is. And, and I think it's already happening. There are lots of new challenger banks in the UK coming into the market and they are great new competition for the high street banks. And what this means is that people can open bank accounts online. They may not have the documentation. They need to open a high street bank, but they may be able to, because these challenger banks, these online banks have, are not as strict as high street banks. They may able to be open. They'll be, be able to open um, a mobile bank account with less information. So therefore, they can start, you know, getting online. They can start banking online. They can start, you know, being, you know, integrating into the cashless society. Not necessarily that they need to be completely cashless, but they can take advantage of the online 
um, so, um, online banking society and the resources that are available for those, including building their credit score and um, getting great deals on interest. Um, and I think that those, that's one of the things that's happening that is so key is this introduction of this new challenger banks and and their attempts to reach a lot of new people, a lot of people who are on banks and people who have had terrible experiences in the past with you know financial services and their rules or regulations. Yeah, agreed. Um, so Elizabeth, when I think of you, you change the way individuals think about money so they can start building wealth. And, and Sheila, you stress the importance of how financial stability helps you lead a healthy life. Can you just share with us the impact your businesses have had on the audiences you serve around the world? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, you know, when it comes to finances, people need to have the knowledge so that they can be empowered to do. If you do not have the knowledge, if you do not have the knowledge, you'll not be able to do it. For example, if I get you a gadget without a manual and you've never seen it, or you've just been seeing it on ads, it will be very hard for you to operate it because you don't have much information how to do it. And chances are high you're going to ruin that gadget trying things out and that's the same thing with money most people don't have enough information that can really empower them to start incorporating those principles into their daily habits into their daily finances so that they can uh, be able to live a financial financially healthy life now at financial wellness center uh we are working around the clock to ensure that many, as many people as possible, especially the millennials, are able to access financial education through our social platforms, which so far we have accumulated around 5,000 people who are constantly checking out our content. We also run um, monthly sessions virtually that allow people to have the I would say a classroom kind of uh, experience whereby you are taught and you get the chance to ask questions and bring your um, your ideas and fears to us who are experts so that you can be able to advise accordingly. And I would also like to like um, encourage the youths that uh, we are living in a world where social media has become a platform where we, we are pushed to live uh, uh, above our means because you want to impress some followers on Instagram and you know however while it's good to um, enjoy life it's also good to be fragile you need to um, know your limits there's no harm of you doing something that is within your budget as compared to having to face consequences that would last even for decades. For example, you could take a debt that would take even a decade to clear up just because you wanted to live beyond your means. So that is what I would say. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Shante. Yeah, I completely agree with Sheila. That's, <laughs> that's a really good point. But yeah, I well from little, we do help people change the way they think about money. And in, in the impact of that has been, we've seen a lot of our people who've come through our programs have reduced their debt drastically, where they've been held debt for many years. In, in a very short period of time, they're able to pay it off, they're able to start investing. And one of the biggest things that we've seen is the breaking of generational patterns. They're able to teach their children. And some in some situations, we've seen them impacting their parents as well. Uh, so it's it's... It's it's a it's an amazing it's an amazing thing to see when generational patterns have, have been disrupted financially. <laughs> Thank you both, Sheila and Elizabeth. This was amazing. Thank you for joining World of Money at Born Rich. And up next, we have Growing Your Money with moderator Vienna Morgan of Morgan Stanley.